Awesome. What's up, Volta? Um, <laughs> excited to be here, chat with you guys. Like you said, my name is Ross Simmons, a digital marketing strategist, entrepreneur, local boy, born and raised uh, here. Um, excited to chat with you guys today about my favorite topic, distribution. Um, but before we jump into that, I do have a confession to make. Um, and this is something that has bugged me and it's stuck with me for many years. Uh, it's something that has impacted my relationships, it's impacted um, my time in university, it, it's going to probably impact me over the course of today um, after we start talking and having a conversation. And it impacts me when I go to weddings, it impacts me when I go to typical marketing communications events on a regular basis. Um, it's this simple, simple issue that I have. Um, and this issue is the fact that Many times when I go to an event, an event like this, as much as I love it, as much as I love the networking portions, as much as I, I love having conversations about things like communications, content marketing, things like that, I often struggle with one simple element. Uh, you see, I'm a wanderer. And when I say wanderer, I'm not talking about that time when I was just four years old at the local fair, probably at the Halifax waterfront, and I got lost, grabbed the hand of a complete stranger, was gone missing for 30 minutes and 18 seconds. No, I'm not talking about that time. Um, I'm talking about wandering as it relates to my thoughts, as it relates to conversations. I'm talking about a wanderer as it relates to information. Um, as a, uh, an example of this, a few weeks back, I was at a marketing event, and I was having this deep conversation with this gentleman, and he was literally inches from my face, and we were talking about vertical video. So if you are familiar with Instagram stories, if you're familiar with Snapchat, you know that vertical video has become a popular topic. It's something that everybody is discussing. And as much as I love having these conversations, talking about how vertical video has changed the way that we consume content, and how horizontal video, while it's relevant, isn't necessarily that relevant when you're talking about a younger audience who is constantly consuming content on their mobile phones vertically, um, as much as I love having those conversations, my mind started to wander. And when I say wander, I'm talking about the fact that there was another discussion that was happening just feet away from me. I'm talking feet away, probably from here to maybe that wall. And instead of listening to the guy who was right in front of my face talking about this video, my brain wandered. It shifted to focus on another discussion, a discussion about butter. Um, now, this isn't anything riveting, right? Like this is not that mind-blowing type of conversation that, that should captivate your attention, something that could just lure you in. But for some reason, I was enthralled by this discussion. They were having a debate of whether or not you should keep the butter on the counter or if you should put the butter in the fridge. And this dude's having this conversation with me and I'm literally like blanked out. All I'm listening to is the pros and cons around putting butter in the fridge and whether or not it should be on the counter. If you want to debate that, we can discuss it later, but the butter belongs on the counter. Um, <laughs> anyways, so <laughs> this conversation is going on, um, and as a result, like this conversation, like I said, inches from my face, my wife happened to join me at this event, and she comes back, and something embarrassing happens. When she comes back, I introduce her as my butter half. <laughs> now, <laughs> when this happened, I was like, oh, geez. I'm sorry, that was a, that was a slip. Um, and I go home and I'm like, okay, what happened there? Because I was embarrassed. Like if you're having a conversation with someone, you're all wearing your suits, you're like trying to be professional and you start introducing your wife as a butter half, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of weird. So I go home and I'm like, what happened to my brain? What allowed my brain to think this way? And it just so happens that this philosophy, this idea of focusing on a conversation that's actually happening outside of like your, your, uh, your general vicinity is actually something that scientists have been studying for quite some time. It's something that they call the cocktail party effect. Now think about the next time that you go to a host party or a kitchen party. We're in Nova Scotia. That's what we do. Um, and when you're in that kitchen party and you're enjoying a few drinks, it's very easy to have your attention focus on a conversation that might be having, happening in the living room. It's something that the cocktail party effect allows us to do very well as humans. What it is is our ability um, within our brain to kind of shut down um, the sounds that are coming to us directly and filter out and focus on the conversations that we actually care about. Um, while scientists don't really know exactly what goes on neurologically to make this happen, this is something that all of us have the power to do. Um, and when I talk about this and I talk about the cocktail party effect, um, the reason why I bring this up is because when you think about the internet and you think about getting your story out there into the world, getting your story in front of your target audience, you have to recognize one thing. The internet is the loudest cocktail party ever, right? Like there's so much content as it relates to blog posts, as it relates to tweets. It's constantly a stream of content being thrown at you. If you go onto your Twitter feed, if you go onto your Facebook news feed, it's very easy to feel like you're drinking out of a fire hydrant because there's so much content, so much noise 
being thrown at you, right? Between the tweets, the Facebook posts, the snaps, the Instagram posts, the stories, the dings and dongs, the notifications, it seems like a never ending stream of noise. And that's just the reality of the world that we live in. But it's the reality, how many people here would consider themselves marketers? A couple, a lot, geez. Well, guess what? It is all our fault. <laughs> it is our fault. It is the marketer's fault. It is our fault for creating this world because for so long, we've been preaching at the top of our lungs that content is king. We've been telling the world you need to create more content. We've been telling the world that if you create more content, great things will happen for your business. You have to write more blog posts. You need to create infographics. You need to create slide shares. You need to be on Snapchat. You need to create more content. We have told that to the world over and over and over again. And as a result, the world has listened, which has resulted in a sea of noise, making it even harder today for you to actually get your story out there, to get your story in front of the right people, in front of the right audience at the right time. We've been preaching this acronym and this entire concept of shout out to Wu-Tang, CREAM. Um, and CREAM, in the marketer sense, means content rules everything around me instead of cash rules everything around me. Um, this is the philosophy that we've been preaching. But my hope today is to show you that this idea, this concept of just create, create content and the rest of things will just happen and flow to drive results for you. It's my hope today to show you that there is a better way. It's my hope to give you some actual tactics that you can run with, use in your business to actually start generating traffic that matters, to show you how to find your audience, who they are, and ensure that the content that you're developing for them is actually relevant. Content that they care about, content that they'll engage with, and content that they're more likely to consume and pass along to their network and share. Um, but recognize that the tactics that I talk about today aren't guaranteed to sh give you success tomorrow because we're going through this crazy phenomenon as it relates to content marketing that's out of even the marketer's hands. Now, if you're familiar with this crazy thing called Google, you can recognize that Google is changing everything. Like, if you look at this search result, they've typed in um, Canon EOS M5 versus Canon 80D. And Google has scraped the website that has a comparison page and they're showing it directly in the search. So that effort that you put into creating a handful of different comparison pages on your website, yes, even if you're in B2B, it's going to be in the future where you start to see Google scrape that content and actually display it right in your search. So what are you going to do then? Because that traffic's not going to your site. So that little lead form that you have at the bottom isn't going to convert. It's not going to get that email that you want because Google's going to scrape it. Oh, you might think, I'm not in that space, Ross. So that's OK. Maybe you have an affiliate site of some sort. Google's coming for you too, right? Like they're taking all of the books and they're placing them directly in the search result. So they're not getting to your website where you would sell your books, where you would get a few pennies for selling a book that uh, links back to Amazon. That's no longer going to be the case. You might be thinking, OK, Ross, but what if I create great content? What if I invest some time and energy into creating some content that goes above and beyond the norm? I add a list or something like that. OK, that's great. But Google's taking that too, right? They're taking the content directly from your site, adding it to a feature snippet, and reducing the likelihood that somebody will actually land on your site. Um, and then you might think, OK, but I'm going to add images. I'm going to add some rich content into that. Sure. Google's doing that too. If you're looking for food to improve your skin health, tomatoes, salmon, water, green tea, garlic, egg is food. They're still working on the natural language thing. But <laughs> that's directly in the search result too, right? Like when you see this, you have to recognize that Google is changing the way that people find content and they're decreasing the likelihood of serving up your content unless it's really good and unless you actually have a way to get to your audience on your own through paid media and through efforts that go outside of the standard SEO. If you're in the B2B space and you think, OK, but what about our job listings? Those are secure, right? Nope. Google <laughs> just announced that they are now going to feature job listings directly in the search result. So that job site that you've built up, you have to look out for this too. right? Google's placing job listings directly in the search result. A few days ago, I decided I was going to look up some things, recipes for kombucha to see like, what was happening. It just so happened I had Moz installed on my browser, which is an app that shows you what is uh, resulting in these links showing up where they are in Google. And if, by standard definition, it should be based off of links. But you can see that this post has 123, this one has 31, this one has 23, has a domain authority of 54, 41, this one has 84. All of the things that typical SEOs would use to determine where they're going to rank in a search result are completely out of the window. 
They make no sense. Like none of this makes sense by standard SEO definitions. And that's why I'm here to tell you today that it's becoming more and more challenging in the world of content marketing to actually succeed because the entire game is changing. It's changing every single day. And the way that we approach it needs to change as well, which is why I believe from the bottom of my heart that content is no longer king. And when I say that, a lot of people raise their eyebrows and they're like, what? Wait a minute, you have to create great content. I 100% get that. I get the fact that you have to create good content. Content is the foundation of marketing. As somebody who runs a content marketing agency, runs a content uh, software system, like it's kind of blasphemous for me to say content isn't king. But in reality, you just have to understand that at the foundation, you should be creating good content regardless. Saying that I create great content is like bragging about raising your kids. You're supposed to do that. That is what you're supposed to do. Do not brag about creating good content. You're not supposed to, right? What you need to focus on now is recognizing that once you've got that foundation laid, it's time to actually start distributing that content into places that matter, into places where your audience is actually spending time, which is why I say we should need to flip that whole concept of cream and start focusing on what I call the dream. Distribution rules everything around me. Um, and this philosophy and this idea really came home for me a few months ago when I came across uh, the New York Times Innovation Report. The Innovation Report was this internal document that New York Times had put together that talked about where they were going to go with their product. It was talking about specifically how BuzzFeed, Vice, Huffington Post, all of these media sites were eating their lunch as it relates to generating traffic, generating results through their media platform. And this quote, from the former CTO of Huffington Post really stood out. It says, far too often for writers and editors, the story is done when you hit publish. At HuffPo, the article begins its life when you hit publish. So the concept that marketers have been preaching for so long about if you publish content, they will come has been really kind of debunked, right? The idea is less about creating content and then just letting it go wild, and more about creating content and then doing as much work as possible to get that post, to get that infographic, to get that slide share, to get that landing page, get that ebook in front of the right people. And you can only do that through distribution. And you have to do that because of the world that we live in today. Eric Schmidt, CEO, founder of Google, said every two days we create as much information from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. That's massive. That's nuts. Think about how much content that is. Every two days. And it makes sense. I mean, when you're taking a photo, you're creating content that no other generation years ago could not create that much content on a regular basis. Between the tweets, the snaps, between all of the content that we're constantly creating, we are creating so much noise. So it leaves us with one simple question. How do I give my content more life? How can I give my content the opportunity to reach the right people at the right time in the right channels. And my focus is really simple. Discover new channels and distribute your content. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how you can discover those channels and distribute your content within them. Um, as a starting point, like I always recommend people to uh, start with one simple tool. And it's a tool that I believe can change your entire business's game. It can change the way that you think about your audience, think about the way that you reach your audience, and it can unlock opportunities that may have been overlooked before. Facebook Audience Insights. If you're not familiar with Facebook Audience Insights, very simple to find. Go to Google, type in Facebook Audience Insights. Um, but essentially what it does is it allows you to get a good look at the demographics and psychographics of a specific audience based off of things like their geolocation, based off of their age, based off of their gender, based off of their interests, based off of a handful of different things that would be relevant to you as a marketer. Now, within this portal, you can simply go in here, you can type in, I'm interested in finding out what people on Facebook in the US are interested in. When you think to yourself, and you might early, early on, a lot of you might be thinking, oh, my audience isn't using Facebook. That's wrong. Um, everybody's on Facebook. Um, when you start with that philosophy and that concept, you need to say, OK, if this is the sample size of the people who are using Facebook within the US, then that's the sample size that you can actually connect with. Um, as an example, if you go into Facebook Audience Insights and you set it up where you want to target fathers, 
you can actually type in that I want to target men over the age of 30 who are a father, and Facebook Audience Insights will spit back at you a handful of information about that audience. So this is, again, where you discover your audience. You discover what they're interested in. This offers you opportunities to be more strategic about your media buy. It offers you an opportunity to learn about the type of content that you should be creating. And you can find out things about them that matters. So you can see, OK, fathers, they're, they're shopping on Amazon.com, Walmart, Target. If you're in the um, consumer product space, that's going to be an area that you need to spend some time. You can see that they're interested in NFL, UFC. So you might want to look for an NFL, UFC podcast that you can sponsor. An actual sponsorship with those brands is going to be pricey. But if you can see that that's, uh, those are two entities that they follow, you can connect with them. Then things get interesting, right? Like you can see that they like this page called I Effing Love Science. Now that's not a big brand. That's not a huge brand. That is a small page that you can reach out to via direct message and be like, hey, I see that you guys have an audience that lines up with mine. How much would it cost for you to actually share one of our blog posts on your site? Or maybe you find out that they have a podcast and you decide to be a guest on their, on their show. So you reach out to them and you're like, hey, what would it take for me to be a guest on your podcast? Or maybe you reach out to them and you ask them, uh, what would it take for us to write a blog on your website? Those are the opportunities that you're going to look for because you know that your audience is there. And you can start to learn about some of the psychographics, right? Like they, fathers like Bud Light and Dasakis. They like bad beer. So that's interesting, <laughs> right? That's an interesting insight that you can leverage um, in your marketing. You can do it even in a local sense. So if you are targeting people who are here in Nova Scotia, you can chuck that into Facebook Audience Insights, and it will show you things that Nova Scotians are interested in. So we love Shoppers Drug Mart. You can see that we um, like WestJet, uh, Candy Crush. Um, if you're trying to buy media, you can see CBC News, Nova Scotia Webcam, CTV News, the Weather Network, of course, our weather's all over the place. Uh, you can see that East Coast Lifestyle is one of the top pages, Tasty, right? Like you can see the types of things that Nova Scotians are interested in. You can do the same things with other audiences. So for example, I was working with a client who was trying to connect with mothers, and we found that there's this page that they were following called Mia. How many of you have heard of Mia before? I didn't think so. They've got 12 million likes on this one single page, right? 12 million people are following this page called Mia that nobody knows about. But if you go into this, you can actually connect with mothers in a channel that you know that they're actually following. And it allows you to get your content, distribute your content, and in a channel that you know your audience is spending time on. And when you do that, the most, the most important factor in all of this is ensuring that it's relevant content, right? So when you find these niche communities and when you find opportunities where you can tell your story in a niche way, it gives you an opportunity to be very relevant with the stories that you're telling. And everybody loves relevancy. What do I mean by that? Let me show you an example. So a friend of mine is a huge WWE fan uh, as well as a Miami Dolphins fan. He's obsessed, like die hard, has his entire basement painted the colors of the Miami Dolphins, and he loves The Rock as well. Um, based off of his Facebook data, if you use Facebook from the time you're in university, you probably like a lot of pages. He happens to like The Rock on Facebook. He also likes The Dolphins. This company had the ability to target him based off of his interest in Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and WWE. What do you think he did when he saw this ad? He bought it immediately. He bought this, and then he sent me a screenshot, and he said, this is creepy. You marketers are doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Um, but at the same time, he bought that shirt immediately because of the relevancy factor that was associated with the content. Now, I do have to do a disclaimer. This is definitely illegal. You can't just take the Rock's photo and brand like his shirt and stuff. Um, so I'm not recommending you do that. Um, but the key is the relevancy, right? Like The relevancy of this is something that all of us can learn from. If you're in B2B and you're targeting a specific business on Facebook, if you have a mailing list from a specific business on Facebook, and you say, hey, their business name, they are going to pay attention. If you say, hey, San Francisco startups, or hey, VCs, they're going to listen to you because you're talking to them, because it is relevant to them. Um, and when I say everyone loves relevancy, I really do mean rel everyone. So Snoop Dogg um, took a screenshot of this post of Ice Cube and then shared it on Instagram to his millions of fans because Snoop's birthday is in October and he saw that Ice Cube was wearing this t-shirt. That's not the best part. The best part is the fact that Ice Cube's birthday is actually in June. Um, <laughs> but he still thought that that was a real thing, so he shared it. Again, it all goes back to relevancy. If you can create content that is relevant to someone, 
Whether you're in B2B or B2C, it doesn't matter. There's an opportunity for you to actually create content that resonates with people, gets the clicks, gets the shares, and ultimately drives home real results for your business. Another underrated channel that I think a lot of people are sleeping on is Facebook groups. Um, so Facebook groups in 2016 cracked 1 billion monthly users for the first time. 1 billion monthly users. People are using Facebook groups to talk about cryptocurrency, to talk about sports, to talk about um, vegan recipes, to talk about barbecue, to talk about t-shirts, to talk about Shopify stores, to talk about home care, to talk about pizza. You name it, there is a Facebook group about the audience. There is a Facebook group where your audience is spending a lot of time in talking about their passions, talking about things that interest them. Um, if you're trying to connect with people in the SaaS world, you simply go to Facebook and you type in SaaS, select groups, and you're going to be met with handfuls of groups where SaaS founders, SaaS marketers, people who are in the SaaS world are talking about that industry on a regular basis. You can do the same thing if you're trying to connect with Shopify experts, you name it. People are in these groups talking about their passions on a regular basis. Three weeks ago, I was using my phone and I came across this screenshot. I grabbed it um, and I included it here. Facebook is running a test right now on mobile devices to see how people respond to having Facebook groups in the bottom right of their navigation. Where it's typically your notification section, they're looking to swap that with the actual groups button. If that rolls out, I guarantee you, Reddit, Stack Exchange, all of these sites need to start trembling. Because if Facebook rolls out groups, it's going to blow up. Because it's no longer going to be something you have to look for. It's going to be something that they're going to be rolling out on my mom's phone. And that's crazy. Um, so more and more, you're going to see the normal people actually joining the groups. And when that happens, it's game over. It's checkmate. Um, use Facebook tags to find relevant groups as well. So if you go into Facebook and you go into the group section, you can actually start doing sorts by different tags. And when you do that, again, it allows you to narrow down your focus into the groups and the communities that matter to you. Um, and if you can't find a group that is relevant to you, create your own, right? Create a Shopify expert group. Create a group about um, healthcare. Create a group for boat, um, boating exchanges. Create a group for whatever it is that your audience is interested in, and then start inviting those people to join it. Once you get them in the group, you have an opportunity to distribute your content there, doing two things. One, Facebook is rolling out advertising within groups, so you'll be actually able to advertise within any of the groups that you want to connect with. Two, you can go into these groups and you can share your blog posts as they go live. So you can say, hey everyone, I'm taking a lot from this community, I really love what you guys are doing, would love to get your feedback on this, check it out. And then they read your post, they give you feedback, and then you just go from there. And the great thing about groups is that they are quickly becoming mainstream as it relates to journalists as well. So I joined a group a few years, probably a year ago now, um, called Bots. Because I know my target audience, entrepreneurs, people who are in the marketing space, people who are interested in bots, um, are relevant to me. So I joined this group called Bots, and a guy named Nick Frost put up a question, and he said, uh, what are the different, different types of business models that you can leverage because of the emergence of bots? So I wrote a post about it. I responded back. I said, yesterday, Nick asked this, que this question. I went to Quora, and I responded to it. So I put it up. Got a bunch of likes. People engaged with it. People said, thank you, Ross. This is great. A journalist happened to be in it as well from a site called Chatbot Magazine. They were like, Ross, we love this answer. Can we feature it on our magazine? Of course I said yes. So they did. Then from there, VentureBeat reaches out because they saw it on Chatbot Magazine and they wanted to feature it as well. So then I got double whammy for taking probably an hour with a glass of wine to answer this question. Um, and then I got coverage on Chatbot Magazine and then VentureBeat. All because I was paying attention to questions that were happening in a group where I knew my audience was spending time. Um, that's the opportunity that exists with Facebook groups. Another opportunity that a lot of people under overlook is graveyard Facebook pages. Um, graveyard Facebook pages is built off of a simple concept. Facebook has been around for many years, and Facebook pages rolled out in 2007. Since 2007, I don't know about you, but a lot of things change in your life. Um, in 2007, I was doing keg stands on Facebook. Now, not so much. Um, but when you go into this, right, you can see that the people who were creating Facebook pages back in 2007 have moved on with life. So some people have Facebook pages that were developed in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010 that they no longer manage. But those pages have hundreds of thousands of followers, hundreds of thousands of people who have liked those pages because they're interested in a specific topic. This page, I Love Engineering, has 92,000 likes on it. 
all they're doing is sharing simple images and they're saying cool, but they have 92,000 <laughs> followers. That's crazy, right? That's a crazy opportunity. So what can you do when you see stuff like this? You reach out. I reached out to a page the other day um, in January and I said, hey, I noticed this page hasn't been active since 2015. Any interest in passing um, it along to someone else for Manjit? He said, yes, I'll sell it for $5,000. I was like, hmm, interesting. So then I asked him to send me Google Analytics. I asked him to send me um, some more information about his page. Turns out the Facebook page had 35,000 likes. Um, he had an email list of 80,000 people. He was averaging about 30,000 views on his website a day. Um, and then I asked him, like, what's your thoughts on a lower price? I didn't say, I need you to lower your price. He's like, the best I can do is 3,000. That's 10 cents a like. Of course, ching ching, thank you. And I've been able to make back $3,000 off of this page in two months, right? That's it. You find these dead accounts, these pages that are relevant to your business, relevant to your audience, and then you reach out. You buy them, take over them, and then you add value to the people who are consuming the content there. Now, if you're in B2B and you've been glazed over, you've been embracing the cocktail effect for the last little bit because I've been talking solely about Facebook, I need you to tell you this. Stop sleeping on Facebook. Stop sleeping on Facebook because if you look at the amount of time that business decision makers are spending on Facebook, it overlooks every single channel by more than double. When it comes to Facebook, they're spending 760 minutes per week on Facebook. Where's LinkedIn? 28 minutes. And you're focused, you're ignoring Facebook? Ain't nobody got time for that. Focus on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a real channel that offers some real opportunities, um, whether you're in B2B, whether you're in B2C. Another great opportunity within Facebook that I think a lot of people sleep on is custom audiences. If you have a mailing list of people who you wanna put your content in front of, Custom audiences directly in Facebook allows you to upload that mailing list and then show ads to those people. So if you have a mailing list of 20 people who you actually have a relationship with or 1,000 people that you want to connect with, you can upload that mailing list directly to Facebook and show ads directly to them. On LinkedIn, you can do the same thing. Um, on Twitter, you can do the same thing. Leverage your email list to actually connect. If you're using MailChimp, you can import it directly into custom audiences to automatically run and target the people who have subscribed to your newsletter, who have given you their email for a webinar, things like that. Interesting story about uh, custom audiences. So a few years back, this guy decided that he was going to run an ad to freak out his roommate. His roommate um, was a sword swallower, but he also had issues swallowing pills. When you have a roommate, you learn a lot about them, and that was one of the things that he learned. He learned that while his roommate was a sword swallower, he couldn't actually swallow pills, so he decided that he was going to run this ad all over Facebook. So he ran this ad, trouble swallowing pills, does it seem ironic that swallowing swords is easy, and then small pills make you gag. So his friend is seeing this ad, and he sends him a text message. He says, I was just exposed to the most targeted ad in the history of ad targeting here on Facebook. He said, find it ironic, blah, 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 blah. Seriously, talk about niche, right? So he's getting this, and he's starting to like have a panic attack. He's freaking out. He's like, what's happening? I can't believe this. Um, and then he ran another ad that just says, ever feel like your roommate is creating Facebook ads targeted to a niche of just you? So he, he, the guy actually shared this like on Twitter and promoted it out there. That week, Facebook changed it so you couldn't have a sample size uh, lower than 1,000 on your custom audience list um, because people started doing this. Geek jokes. I love it. Um, but one thing you can do if you want to get a little creepy is you can export all of your connections from LinkedIn. If you have over a thousand connections, you just go to linkedin.com slash export, I believe, and it will allow you to export out all of your connections, first name, last name, and their email. You can upload that to a custom audience, run an ad that says, we're connected on LinkedIn. Why don't you like my business too? And then they'll like it. Um, so yeah, that's a quick hack that you could leverage. Another interesting insight, a lot of people are sleeping on Facebook search, but if I was to make a recommendation and a prediction, which I rarely make, it would be that Facebook search is going to become an actual very relevant search tool um, in the years to come. If you go into Facebook and you go up to search, instead of searching for your ex's name, I want you to search for benefits of bananas or something like that. And you're going to find that the results are actually not that bad. Um, if you type in things that you would typically search, like restaurants to eat at in Halifax, I can promise you that the results will not be that bad. Um, I'm a, I predict that Facebook search is going to have a huge impact in the way that we search, the way that our audience searches, and especially as the younger demographic becomes older and older because they're using WhatsApp, they're using Instagram, all of these platforms are owned by Facebook, and they're all going to emerge into one um, as it relates to the search piece. I could geek on that, but that's another topic. 
So let's talk about another opportunity that exists, um, niche communities. So the same way that you can find niche communities on Facebook, you can find niche communities within different sectors of the web. Um, this is an area that I think a lot of people, again, underrate. And it's those old school forums. It's those old school message boards where people are having detailed conversations on a regular basis where you can find some of the most passionate people about some niche topics, some interesting insights, um, and they're sharing things that they're truly passionate about. So whether it's hacker news, if you're trying to connect with developers, you go to a Bitcoin forum, if you're trying to connect with people in the crypto space, these communities are where some of the most passionate people in the world are spending their evenings, spending their mornings, talking about things that they love, whether it's photography, whether it's videography, you name it. These forums still exist online. So invest the time and energy of going into these forums, adding value through conversation, and then injecting your content within it as well. Um, the value of niche communities really came home to me when I was at MozCon last year, um, and Rand Fishkin put up this slide. He put up this slide, and it truly changed the way that I've approached marketing um, in the last year. So the top receiving sites uh, for generating Google traffic are all of these. But look at number 5, 7, and 14. Stack Overflow, Reddit, and Quora. Um, there's a few there that you can ignore, but <laughs> outside of those, there's a lot of relevancy um, for marketers. So when you think about this, Stack Overflow, Reddit, and Quora are generating, in, they're in the top 20 sites that are generating 22.8% of all Google traffic. That's massive. So 22% of all site traffic in the world are going to these 20 sites, right? This is the 20% that you need to care about because this is where Google is sending people. So if you see that people are being sent to Reddit, people are spending time on Quora, they're being sent to these sites, it only makes sense to invest some time and energy in getting your content distributed on these channels. Stack Overflow is sort of like a Reddit or a typical forum site. What they do is they have a variety of different sections where you can have conversations about things like biology, about information security. They're averaging 100 million monthly visits every single month. That's crazy, right? So again, this is an opportunity where you can think about your niche, think about the audience that you're trying to connect with, and they're spending time here talking about things that matter to them. There's photography um, groups on this site, there's tech groups, there's startup groups, there's founder groups, there's tons of groups where they're spending tons of time talking about their passion, and you have an opportunity to jump in here and seed your content in those communities. Then there's Reddit and Quora, uh, two channels that I love. I've been on the front page multiple times. Uh, Quora has been a top writer since 2015. Two sites that I definitely recommend you spend some time thinking about as well. Um, but when you think about them, you have to think about them in a different way. Uh, when it comes to Quora, what I constantly recommend people is that you look for answers or you look for questions that are relevant to your industry. And then when you find them, you're going to add value first uh, before you actually plug your own content. What I mean by that? So when you go to Quora, if you're in the CRM space, if you're trying to connect with people who are sales professionals or someone in that space, you might go to Quora and you type in CRM. Then you're gonna be met with a handful of questions. Uh, what will come after social CRM? What is the customer lifestyle, lifetime value in CRM? You could go into these questions and answer them with high value responses, and in those, you have plugs of your own blog posts, of your own website, of your own content, things that you've developed. So Jason Lemkin, he's gone in here. Uh, he runs Saster Ventures, which is a venture fund that targets SaaS products. He goes in, and the question was, what are some easy ways to increase sales? He said, here are my seven top tips. He goes through that, and he's actually just delivering as much value as he can with those tips. But if you notice, this link goes back to Saster's website. So he's answering it with value, but then he's plugging his own content. At the bottom here, he also says, also a great post here on some tactical ideas. So again, he's adding value first and then plugging his own content second. So when you go into these communities, go in with the intent of adding value to the lives of your readers, of the people who are gonna find this question, and then inside of that, don't be afraid to inject your own story, to inject your own blog post. Um, Jason Lemkin is without question one of those people on Quora who I would recommend you check out. Uh, these are the most viewed writers in sales, right? So these people have a specific section on Quora that is focused on, on them, where you can find them, you can learn about their business, you can learn, you can see all of their answers, and four of them have more than 47,000 views in the last 30 days. In the last 30 days, just by answering questions. Jason Lemkin has 124,000 views. 
Not bad. Like that's, that's impressive. So when you see <laughs> opportunities like that, you have to say, OK, what are the questions that are being asked about my industry on this community? What questions are being asked about my product on this community? And then you jump in there and you add value um, by also plugging your own content as well. Quora also just recently rolled out advertising, so you can now run ads on Quora uh, where you can target based off of the topics that people follow. So people on Quora follow things like finance, mortgages, they might be following marketing, they might be following crypto. You can actually target them based off of the topics that they follow. Again, it goes back to that concept of relevancy. Discover your audience and distribute your content. If you know that your audience is a certain type of person, they're probably following a certain type of topic. So why not ensure that your content is showing up when they're looking at that topic? I ran some tests with this, and the click-through rate is extremely low because this is, no, the, click, the cost per click is extremely low because it's still so new. Um, so there's not a lot of competition when you go into some niches. So definitely recommend you check that out. Um, Reddit is another great community that I recommend people check out. Reddit's interesting because whenever you talk about it with marketers, everybody tends to get the heebie-jeebies. They're like, oh, you shouldn't market on Reddit. That's not a thing that you should do. Um, and I get that. I 100% get it. I'm a Redditor. Like, I love Reddit as a community. And I understand that hesitation. Um, and I remember when I first jumped into Reddit, and the approach that I took was very straightforward. Like, I took all of these blog posts that I had written over the years, and I went to this subreddit called Our Technology, where people talk about technology all the time. And I said, OK, I'm going to crack Reddit. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to prove to people that you can find success on Reddit no matter um, who you are, no matter where you're from. You can find success on Reddit. So I took all of these blog posts, and I started to submit them like crazy. I just started submitting my links, started to submit them. And next thing you know, I got blocked. I was banned by Felicia. You're out of here. Um, so when that happened, I was like, OK, I could have walked away and said, I'm done with Reddit. I'm not going to use this as a channel anymore. But instead, I took a different approach. I decided to actually understand why what I was doing on Reddit wasn't working. And the reason why was because I didn't understand what people in these communities actually wanted. I didn't have the empathy to care about what the people on the other end of the computer actually wanted. I just wanted to get my content to generate some traffic, to get some views. Instead, what I did was that after realizing that there was a huge gap between what I wanted and what the people in the community wanted, I decided that I had to study what Reddit was all about. And to do that, you can sort content by the top posts. And when you sort content on Reddit by the top posts, it allows you to see what the community is actually uploading. And what you'll realize is that different communities want different things. Communities like Our Entrepreneur want blog post formatted content rather than you just submitting a bunch of links. You'll realize that Barbecue wants recipes. If you just upload a photo of your food, they're going to yell at you. Um, they want you to tell you how you made that. That is the reality of how Reddit works. So my recommendation would be to sort content based off of the communities that are relevant to you, look at what those top posts are, and then reverse engineer what allowed them to go viral, what allowed them to generate traction. And you'll see that communities like Futurology, Futurology love Elon Musk. You write something about Elon Musk, you put it up there and it's positive, they're going to go nuts every single time. Guarantee it. I've used the same post three times, front page. Um, and they just love it, right? So you can recognize those trends, recognize those insights, and you can use them to generate results for your business. Um, use top posts to also figure out what content will work on your Facebook page. Uh, this guy, Alex Klokos, he runs a, um, a massive Facebook page. I forget what it's called. I think it's Future of Humans. And what he does is very simple. He sorts content by the top posts, uh, repurpose them into a video content. So he'll take this article. Researchers have developed an ultra-thin, ultra-flexible, protective layer of skin, blah, 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 all that stuff. They repurposed that entire article into a video. They didn't submit that. They didn't find it originally. They use it as a research tool, turn it into a video, and then it generates 7.2 million views. Um, simply by seeing what was going viral in Reddit or what was hot on Reddit, repurposing it for their own content, telling that same story in a different lens, and it works for them. Um, great opportunity. A lot of people are sleeping on Reddit. It's huge. Another opportunity, you can actually distribute your content now directly on Reddit through ads. They rolled this out, I believe it was the end of Q3 last year. Uh, it allows you, again, to put your ads directly into communities where people are spending time. Now, that's a lot about the web platforms and some things like that. Now, I want to talk about another channel that, again, I think a lot of people are sleeping on, Slack communities. So how many people here use Slack? I think I heard one. Yeah, yeah. So you might think of Slack as a place where you communicate with colleagues, with peers, with friends, and things like that. 
Slack is quickly evolving from just being an internal communications tool to a tool where people are connecting with people from all over the world, building great relationships, um, closing uh, leads, like making sales, generating revenue for their business. There are communities built around Slack where people are having discussions on a regular basis about their business, having discussions about their passions. Um, and you can find these communities as opportunities to seed your content into them. So for example, if you find a community that's all about marketers and you're a marketer, you go in there and you can actually start to submit your content within them. And then people start to see them, they start to share it. You add it to one of the channels that might be called must reads. You include your content, they read it, they love it. Um, there's this website called Slackless, which lists all of these different communities that you can find. So you'll find content, uh, you'll find communities about startups, communities that are built around introverts, communities that are focused around gaming, iOS development. You can find all of these different communities that are, again, relevant to you. And once you find them, it's your opportunity to distribute your content within them. So you use these communities as a place to give feedback on your ideas, to get them to visit your website, to give you feedback on your product, to again, engage in a community that is relevant to you. Build real relationships. Um, there's also opportunities to find communities like Maker Hunt, which is a spinoff from Product Hunt, where they have a, a channel, I think I'm in 15 of these different Slack channels now, and my phone is like constantly dinging. Um, a few weeks back, I was in a Slack channel, and I was at dinner, and my phone was just blowing up. I thought there was a fire on my team. I thought everything was falling apart. I started to freak out. Um, and on Slack, it actually just has notifications if somebody mentions your name. Turns out, people were just having a debate about Rick Ross, um, not actually <laughs> Ross. So I was getting these notifications for nothing. Um, but within these Slack channels, like I was saying, there's opportunities where you'll see a channel called Promo Help. And if you have a channel called Promo Help, you can add a link and people will start to promote your content for you. So all of the people who have joined that community will promote your content, promote it and share it um, and spread it on their Twitter, on their LinkedIn, on their Facebook. And if you're all in one Slack channel somewhere, you should probably have a channel that is called Promo Help. And then if a press release goes out about your company, everybody share your link there and then you share it together. Um, what's also great about Slack is they've created this thing called um, highlights. And what highlights allows you to do is it allows you to focus on a few keywords. So if I'm in hundreds of Slack channels, I'm in 15 or so, I can set it up so if anybody mentions content marketing, crate, hustle and grind, Ross, any of these keywords that are relevant to me, I can ensure that I get a notification to my phone when that is mentioned. So if I'm in a community that's all entrepreneurs and they say, um, we're looking for a content marketer or a content agency, I have it set up to get a notification when that word is said so I can be the first one to jump in there and jump into that discussion. Think about, again, your community. What are some keywords that they might be talking about when they're looking for a solution that you could offer? Um, Slack is a great opportunity for that. Another great channel for distribution is Medium. A lot of people uh, look at medium.com as a place where uh, you would replace your entire blog. I don't see it that way. I see Medium as a, an opportunity to be similar to like guest blogging a few years ago, where you use Medium as a place to distribute your blog posts. Always write your blog posts on your own website first, and then you republish it on medium.com. Once you do that, all of your Twitter followers, if they've signed up for Medium, are going to get a notification that you published this post. After that, what I want you to do is go find a publication. When I say publication, on Medium, there are a handful of different publications that are kind of like mini magazines under the umbrella of medium.com where you can actually submit your content to reach a bigger audience. So there's uh, communities like the Chatbot Magazine, which runs on Medium's platform that you can submit your content to and then reach their hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, similarly, I wrote a blog post about Slack bots and what they taught me about a great onboarding experience. The folks at Slack saw my blog post. They asked me to submit it to their publication. It then reaches them. Um, and it goes on to be shared and seen by hundreds of people. Again, those are the opportunities that exist through medium.com. Create your own content, distribute it to your network, and then add it to a publication that has a broader reach. That's constantly my recommendation when it comes to this channel. Now, you guys might be thinking, bruh, what's right for me? That's a lot. Um, and I get it. Like, I get it. That is a lot of stuff to talk about. That's a lot of channels. That's a lot of different things that some of you might be glazing over. I get it. I understand. Um, but recognize, it all starts with one single thing. It all starts what I talked about right at the beginning, which is starting with understanding who your audience is and where they're spending time. Do you have to be on Reddit, Slack, Quora, um, Stack Exchange, Facebook groups, um, all of these different channels? Not at all. Not at all. 
but you do need to understand where your audience is spending time and you have to double down at least for a short period of time in experimenting with these communities, experimenting with getting your content inside of the communities and seeding it to them because that's where you're going to find your breakthroughs. That's where you're going to find opportunities that will change the game for your business. Um, and remember, at the core, distribute content worth distributing, right? You can't just create a blog post in 20 minutes and call it a day. If you're not great at creating content, that's okay too. It's kind of like riding a bike. Over time, it gets easier. Um, you have to invest time and energy into truly understanding what your audience want, the type of content they want, and then seeding it to them in the right place. Because at the end of the day, you have to also recognize that you're not just competing with the person next to you as it relates to these eyeballs. You're competing with the entire landscape of startups. This is a chart of all of the marketing technology companies that rolled out in 2017. That's insane. Right? That's what you're up against. You're up against all of these marketing companies. You're up against um, the, the YouTube channels. You're up against the influencers. You're up against me. You're up against everyone. So think about who your audience is and start laying the bricks that you need for tomorrow today. Um, because that's the only thing that you can really do. Don't get me wrong. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take um, both a little bit of long-term thinking and some strategic tactical efforts to take today. But if you do that, if you invest the energy today to really prepare yourself for the future, you're going to be better off. You're going to be more likely to tell a story that actually resonates with people. Um, so as you think about the stories that you tell, as you think about the communities that you inject your story into, I push you to embrace new ideas. I, embrace, I push you to embrace new tactics, to embrace new strategies, and to embrace the idea of leveraging tactics that may not have been seen as the, the norm, to embrace channels that everybody else is avoiding, and to embrace going after channels and communities that other people um, say are irrelevant because that's where, again, you'll find, some, you'll find some relevancy for your own brand. And when you think about marketing, you think about communications, a lot of people raise their hand when it came to um, being a marketer. And for us in this industry, if you want to survive, if you want to compete with the robots, if you want to compete with Google, there is no question that you actually have to innovate, that you have to take the time, take the energy, to actually take a step forward and try something a little bit different. Don't get me wrong, it's gonna to be tough, but at the end of the day, if you make those changes today and you start to embrace it moving forward, you'll look back at all of those efforts, all of those late nights, all of that hard work, and you'll say, was it worth it? And I'll say, you better believe it. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening.